Okay, okay. Yeah. So, let me start. Yes, sir. We can start, sir. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of ICSI IIP, I welcome all of you to this webinar. Today, uh, we are going to discuss on the subject uh, Section 53, the Heart of Insolvency Law. The section, as you know, it is deal with, deals with the distribution of assets during the uh, CRP process. Today we have Mr. Vinod Kothari with us on this uh, session. He is an insolvency professional, a fellow member of ICSA, and an associate member of ICA. He is a vivid speaker with various institutes and professional forums. So over to Mr. Vinod Kothari. Very good afternoon, all of you, and I hope uh, all of you are keeping fine and well. Um, we are into a uh, into a different frame of uh, the world, and uh, well, I think uh, good thing is that institutes are constantly keeping people updated. Uh, several webinars every now and then. And these webinars, uh, while they keep us um, input, they also keep us uh, engaged. Um, so I, once again, thank you, uh, IIP of uh, ICSI, and particularly Dr. Vinay, uh, for uh, allowing me the opportunity of interviewing all of you. Um, the way I would request all of you to maybe interact, while I'll definitely love to interact with you all, and I would love to see your queries and uh, with you, but what I would request all of you is to uh, observe some, uh, I mean, essential rules. To begin with, I would request people not to put pleasantries such as good uh, or your salutations on the chat board because that alters the chat board and if you are not able to see meaningful queries from the participants. That's the first thing. And secondly, I would expect, I would allow people to maybe take um, uh, interventions of something like five to ten minutes during my uh, call, during my talk. And I would request people to have questions at that time when we have scheduled, um, I mean, five to ten minutes of breaks in between, uh, so that we don't have uh, queries as I go, because that, that may not be the best way to interact with everyone. Uh, so that, that's my request to all of you. Uh, keep uh, the chat board as clean as possible, not to put uh, pleasantries there. And uh, let me maybe come to question answers when we have uh, a specific time for that. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you be uh, saying that we now have questions and answers. We can probably uh, take questions and answers in a time. Uh, with this, um, I will start the, the topic today for me is an extremely interesting topic. This is what I've uh, called the heart of solvency law. Section 53, which is dealing with the word of all, which is the priorities. And I am assuming all of you participating here are insolvency professionals, and all of you would easily agree that this is the very heart of insolvency law. In fact, um, Section 53 sort of encompasses the entire insolvency framework. It is the genesis of insolvency law captures the entire insolvency framework. Now I'll build up my talk by narrating a small story. The story might be a nice decent break also because you all I guess would be hearing the about coronavirus every now and then and probably also be hearing uh, lots of the lectures by different professionals. So I'm allowing a short break from that and starting about a story which is extremely uh, interesting story. Uh, that is called a story of Akbar and Birbal. Now you can attribute this kind of story to the Akbar Birbal or to Tenali Rama or to whoever you think is a witty person. There is the story of a small witty person. Akbar and Birbal is, let's say, is a, is a, is a, is a, are the characters. Of the so one day Akbar asks Birbal three difficult questions 
in expect be able to answer the questions if be able is unable to answer the questions then akbar is likely to punish be able now what are the questions sir tell me where is god so the first question is tell me where is god first question 2 tell me how do i find god second question and the third question what all can god do so three questions once again tell me where is god how can i find god and what can god ultimately do now bilgul obviously takes this question like me because uh, these questions are quite complicated and i'm sure you realize that over thousands of years philosophers have been trying to answer these questions these questions do not have easy answers so bilgul whom he was obviously quite worried and next day during the session of the king's court once again and akbar asked him have you found answers to the three question bilgul says yes your lordship yes your uh, royalty or your royalness i indeed have found answers to the questions tell me the answer to the questions and this is how birbal answers the first question god so what birbal has in his hand is a glass of sweetened milk the milk is obviously sweetened with sugar they added into the milk and it is sweet and offers the glass of milk to akbar he drinks it tastes and then birbal says did you have the milk sweet said of course it sweet can you see sugar into it I'm sure sugar cannot be seen because it is only mixed up into into the milk. So that's the first question getting answered. Everywhere, like the like the sugar is mixed into the milk. You can taste, you can, see, you can sense it, but obviously you cannot see because it's it's all pervasive. So God is all pervasive. You cannot see it because now it's a part of the milk in your head. So God is everywhere. It's inside me. It's inside in every object you see. but just that you cannot see it separately because it's now it's it's pervasive across all the entities all the things and entities that we see across so that answers the first question second question akbar says how do i find god so for this again we have a kind of stuff get me uh, some pot of milk and then he starts churning the milk so as he churns the milk what he does is butter and he says your royal highness you see the butter inside the milk it was not visible earlier now it's churned and the butter is now visible so what is how does that answer the question the question is the butter was already there in the milk it's a bit of churning of your mind churning of your heart churning of your uh, wisdom that you can still find god so that answered the third question second question of akbar this third question was still remaining so what about my third question my third question is what on can god do So to this, Birbal says, "Your Lord, I know. I have already answered two of the questions. So at this stage, you should be able to respect me and say, 'I am God.'" So Akbar was obviously very modest, so he prepared to accept Akbar, Birbal as Akbar's guru. He said, "Okay, I admit I accept that you are my guru." So the moment Akbar says, "You are my guru," Birbal says, "If he, if I am your guru, it cannot be such that you are seated on the throne." and i'm standing hand folded in front of you so why don't you come down and stand where i am and i'll put a sit on the throne but once again akbar was quite modest and quite receptive so he came down and allowed birbal to sit on the throne and then birbal while smiling said your lordship your royal highness that answers the third question god can do this this is not even the discussion of what is done it has put you on the throne and put me on the throne so god can do all of this god can put people on the throne god can dethrone people god can do everything momentarily the way we have just seen it happen right in front of you so this alex dot now if you are wondering whether we are a class of insolvency or hearing akbar weebel tales i was very quickly turned back to insolvency law and really as to what does this alex dot have to do with the concept i was talking about so i was saying like concept of god which is all pervasive similarly the concept of that is an insolvency law is completely all pervasive it pervades all if there is insolvency is there in bankruptcy is there in resolution is there everywhere the priorities of section 53 is something which is all pervasive the first comparison with the birbal tale second comparison was 
how do I find God as we can really to churn. So that, that's precisely what we're doing today. We are churning through the insolvency law. We are churning through the tremendous amount of learning that we have had over the years. Not just go through in Tanisha, but go through across the world to find the price of insolvency law. It's been a very intriguing and thematic topic. We're doing the churning to find the actual priorities of insolvency law hidden in the heap of insolvency rulings over the years. And that's the second element of compassion. And the third element is the most interesting part. As the priority of Akbar and Birbal was determined by God, the priority that matters all, I mean, everything that all about insolvency law is all about priority. So priority is most important who is seated on the throne, who is the senior one, who is the junior one, all of that is determined by priority. So priority fix whether you will get the money or not get the money, and that is exactly similar to whether you will be seated on the throne or you will have the kingdom to you or you will simply be a subject standing uh, fold with folded hands in front of someone. That's all dependent on the extent of priority. So that, that's exactly uh, the, the, the relevance of priority in insolvency. Uh, with this bit of small anecdote, I am going to switch to a topic unless you think that I am going to spend a lot of time on what we will take. Let me straight come to section 53 of IBC, which as I say, the heart of insolvency law. When I say heart of insolvency law, I actually was going to say that insolvency laws owe their origination, they owe the genesis to the concept of priorities. Why is that important? Because priorities were the very genesis, the very origin of insolvency law goes to the concept of priorities. Insolvency laws are all about rateable or equitable distribution. Rateable or equitable distribution is the very essence of insolvency laws. Now, just try to study insolvency laws. What happens? This person who has run of money to pay off his creditors, the person that is are insolvent. And there comes the question of proportional or rateable distribution. If we do not have rateable or proportional distribution, the creditors who are able to put maximum pressure, the creditors who are able to put maximum duress, they will be the ones who get paid. Might is right becomes the principle. The general rule which is might is right becomes the principle in insolvent administration or insolvency administration as well. In order to make sure that it's not the general rule or might is right rule and instead we have a rateable distribution of that's why that's why insolvency laws broke the concept equitable or uh, um, or, or so called rateable or equitable distribution that is the sense of insolvency laws were lower. Now the moment we talk about rateable distribution, please you understand that not everyone can be taken at par. So this is a question of priority there as well. There will be people of different rankings. So rankings of people and inside the rank everybody taken proportionally or equitably. That's the essence of priorities. Priorities becomes the very essence or the very uh, so called the very genesis of the laws world over, and that allows us to maybe start with the topic. Like we were mentioning earlier, um, we are talking about uh, reasonable distribution. So we are talking about a, we are talking about what is the meaning of prioritization? What does priority actually mean? What is priority? Priority could actually have two shades of meaning. Number one, priority based on senior ranking, priority based on ranking. Number two, priority based on time sequence. Priority based on ranking and priority based on time sequence basically seem to be the same thing. The one who is prior, the one who is senior stays ahead of the other. Based on the timing also doesn't mean that the person who is senior has to be paid first. So normally priority in terms of ranking and priority in terms of time sequence should go hand in hand. But there might be situations where you could probably see that somebody senior in terms of ranking, but still someone who is junior in terms of priority be paid in terms of timing sequence ahead of the one. So I'll give you a quick example of that. Think of corporate finance. I mean, the concept of prioritization is equally prevalent. Corporate finance as well. Think of a company. Now, if you think of a company, what we have in case of companies, we have payments to external filters and then we have distribution of dividends to shareholders. So what do companies do? Companies first make payment of interest and first make payment of payments to creditors 
and then the so called residual profits the profits available for distribution are thereafter distributed to shareholders however there may be situations where if the company's finances so permit a company may even think of distributing dividends before making payment to for example that's said exactly that what we mean by interim dividends 31st march 2020 lots of companies went at for interim dividends the reason is dividend tax but when companies do distribute in dividends so the question is that if i have sufficiency of profit if i'm not in situation of insufficiency they're not in situation of deficit it is possible to make the solutions to those who are junior ahead of those who are senior but normally speaking a priority in terms of ranking should also be translating to a priority in terms of time sequence particularly when you talk about deficit so insolvent Insolvent distribution, distribution by insolvent company. We talk about insolvency law. So we'll be majorly concerned with insolvency company. In case of insolvent company, be it in case of liquidation or be it in case of, we talk about priority. It has to be priority both in terms of ranking as also in terms of time. When I talk about ranking, what I basically mean is deficit. Who takes the deficit? So deficit the distributor starting point. The last in the rank, the last in the priority order takes the losses first, takes the deficit first. So we start moving bottom up in terms of deficit, and we start moving down when it comes to. So cash flows move top down, and the losses or deficits move bottom up. This concept of priority terms, this should only translate into priority in terms of cash flows, in terms of timing of cash flows as well. The concept of waterfall, the concept of priority, is all pertinent in insolvency jurisprudence, and that's all about what I call distributive justice. So, or the allocation order, or the priority order, the appropriation order. I want to even call it. We very commonly call it waterfall. The concept of waterfall is basically the distributive justice, because the idea basically we're talking about inadequacy. We're talking about in insufficiency. In a situation of inadequacy or insufficiency, we need to make sure that the distribution of assets, distribution of money or assets, does justice, does equity and justice to the claim. So the concept of distributive justice is not limited to liquidation. Section 53 is appearing as a part of sections dealing with liquidation. Section 53 is housed in the bunch of sections dealing. equation and therefore they, there are at times there are uh, there are even been rulings of enclad to go to say that section 53 is dealing with liquidation so why resolution should i look at the dog but the question basically is that in resolution as well you cannot be completely divorced you cannot be completely disconnected with the concept of distributive justice because resolution cannot do injustice to any of the stakeholders Concept of resolution also implies the or the priority of section 53 is what is inherent in section 30. Now I guess all of you have access to the code. Section 30 is a very important section, and I'm guessing all of you can very quickly refer to the section as well. The section talks about it talks about what is the minimum resolution that a resolution plan must do. That is, that's the minimum that resolution plan has to offer, and that's what section 30, section 30, section 30, subsection 2. Uh, it, it, you, so when you present the resolution plan, section 30, subsection 2 says, resolution professionals shall examine the resolution to confirm that each such resolution plan, and number one, it provides uh, for example the resolution process cost, but part is important. Provides for payment of debts of operational creditors in such manner as may be specified by the board. Debts not less than the amount to be paid to such creditors in the event of liquidation. So that's where the concept of liquidation is coming. You can see straight to the reference to section 53, which says to operational creditors, the resolution plan can also in less than liquidation value. Liquidation value of the library. When we talk about liquidation value, we talk actually about the assets. The, but the moment assets are distributed, 
in a putative that is imaginary distribution to the statement we talk about liquidation value of the liability that's what is liquidation analysis i'll i'll very briefly talk about the liquidation analysis shortly from now so i think 30 subsection 2a the resolution plan as a as a as a of essential feature while supremacy given to the decisions of the cot the cot has supremacy wisdom question wisdom cannot be questioned even by the adjudicating body and yeah, that's that's very settled now with supreme court ruling in sr c but the point is that even though uh, the supremacy of cot's wisdom is respected by the adjudicating body but section 30 by subsection 2 is of essential feature of a resolution Clearly has the concept of distributive justice. 
and that is essential to resolution process as well. So let no one think that this is relevant only in case of liquidation. This is equally relevant in case of resolution as well. Now, of course, the liquidation section 53 is one of the very important sections. So there's no doubt that section 53 is relevant to a liquidation. Now come to the third part. What about liquidation? Voluntary liquidation or voluntary winding up of companies. There's no of insufficiency there. The company's assets are sufficient because one of the one of the declarations we make, one of the one of the conditions preceding to a voluntary liquidation is that the company is solvent because we make a declaration of solvency when we start the voluntary liquidation because the company is anyway solvent. If the company is solvent, what does that mean? That the, that the funds or the assets are sufficient to pay off everyone. If the funds or the assets are sufficient to pay off everyone, where is the question of distribution priority at all? How does priority at all matter? Uh, I am sure with reflection all of you can understand that priority matter when we have a shortfall. When we don't have a shortfall, why should we be at all concerned with priorities? I mean, think of the uh, food packet distribution queues. Uh, you can see those on the TVs every day these days. Uh, thousands of people queuing up for food packets. If the food packets are sufficient, how does priority matter? Because after all, everyone is going to get it. But in the situation, the food packet was not packets were sufficient, or the food on table was not sufficient. That's where the question of prioritization comes. Who gets first? So priorities become important when we have a question of shortfall. A voluntary liquidation, by definition, is not a case of shortfall. So priority should, in, as a matter of principle, should not matter. However, section 59, subsection 6 itself is connected to section 53. It incorporates or draws the reference section 53 there as well. Okay, that even in case of a voluntary liquidation, section 53 becomes important. That would mean not in a voluntary liquidation also. When it starts, the liquidator starts paying off the claimants. He cannot start drawing and start distributing money to shareholders first. Before he pays it off to creditors, he should pay off to creditors first. He should do in the same order of price as is given by section 53, because who knows the assets may subsequently fall and it might be a question of shortfall. Before we proceed to the inherent distribution, just quickly some very quick time, a little, uh, uh, little time spent on some uh, situations. Uh, particularly liquidation, and to ask the question whether the concept of priority in section 53 is relevant in these cases as well. Now, one of the cases is one of the cases is sale of a bill, sale of the corporate debtor as a going concern. Um, my concern about going concern never stops; it continues to go on. Uh, this is a topic on which we have been expressing a concern for. More than I think more than a couple of years now, and that concern still continues to go on because we've never been able to resolve the riddle of a sale sale concern. The sale by going concern happens. Is section 53 at all still relevant? For example, selling the corporate debtor itself in liquidation, I am selling the corporate debtor. What does that mean? Would that mean the assets and libraries both go to the acquirer, or only the assets go to the acquirer? If the assets as well as the liabilities were to go to the acquirer, then section 53 will become completely meaningless. Whoever takes the corporate debtor will still be liable to pay each creditor. So the very concept of prioritization, which as I mentioned earlier, that's the extent, so that's the crux of insolvency laws. The concept of the crux of priorities will become completely redundant. If you were to take the view that it is going to be transferred the liabilities travel along with that. That's not the case. So the law has not provided a flexibility. It can actually decide which liabilities will go. But practically, I cannot decide any of the liabilities that is transferred along with transfer of either the assets or the corporate debtor itself. It would mean even if I'm transferring the legal entity, even if I'm transferring the corporate debtor itself, all the liabilities will stay here. Will exist where they are, they will become in the liquidation estate. 
and the money management transfer of the corporate data will be a part of liquidation stage from which decisions will be done. The concept of liquidation stage is acting is exactly that. Even in case of a going concern, I have no doubt on that. Uh, this point we discussed, the participants actually had three queries on this, so I'll, I'll let you be discussing I mean, participants' questions later. But the concept of uh, priorities is held in a going concern transfer as well. Next question that comes is liquidation, liquidation relates to a section 230 restructuring. It's to say, Um, okay, I want to see that the audio is not coming clear. Uh, typically, benefit issues, I would uh, do what I can to maybe try and uh, I don't know what can I actually do. Uh, okay. I, I can see as it is on the chat, there are lots of questions already. Uh, though I would once again request that maybe uh, until we come to a stage of questions, maybe participants can keep the questions parked. I can speak, I can try to speak slow if that helps. Bandwidth is something on which I have very little control, but let me just uh, once again. Okay. Okay. I've got a feedback that's very, very poor audio. So can I do what? Can I maybe try to switch my connection and see if that makes it better? So give me one minute of uh, trying to switch into switch to a different network and see if that helps. All this can be a moment, all of you. Um, okay, I am hoping this is this is what I could have done. I've just changed my network connection to a different connection. I'm hoping this is better, but that's all I could do. Are you all able to hear me, Mr. Chakra? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are able to hear you. There is some request from the participants as well. Uh, like you are going too fast on the flight and not able to get the what you are actually saying. Actually, uh, I think your audio may not be on. So we are going fast on the. Are you able to hear me, Chakshuji? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. And uh, is the audio better and the video is also okay? Video is also okay. Oh, perfect. So I think that makes it uh, best to better. Um, then apologize for the network issues because these are issues these days with uh, almost every network. Uh, I'm sure all of you that it's a bandwidth uh, challenge. I mean, all so many meetings happening all at the same time. Thousands of meetings happening all at the same time. Probably still a burden on the on the on the bandwidth. So I'm saying, if the liquidation proceedings migrate into a scheme of arrangement, because the liquidator also has the power to not go for liquidation, but to move for a section 230. So if the matter moves to a section 230 scheme, in that case, what? Uh, I'm I think reiterating. Switch off the video. Okay, um, I, I have no issues in switching off the video as well. Okay. So it will give us more uh, interaction with the button. Right. I'm, I'm once again hoping that it's better. Yes, sir, uh, we are getting your voice clearly. Right. And you don't need to see me any, so there's nothing to see. So no, if you want, you can in between you can show, us, uh, show your video as well. 
Yeah. Now, I, I thought uh, the idea was to turn off the video so that the audio becomes better. Yes, it, it is better now. Right. So intermittently, if needed, if needed, I'll turn the video on. Actually, yeah, it's easy for me to drink water and uh, do whatever. So, you, um, yeah, um, right. Some people are asking me to repeat the slide also. I'll just, just once again come back. But uh, just uh, as I was mentioning earlier, and I would repeat my request, that I can see several participants are, several participants are putting questions as we are speaking. Now, since I'm not reading really questions just now, I'll have to scroll up, I'll have to scroll up meters up to see where the question gets lost. So that would amount to losing questions. So my request is please don't put questions right now. We'll allow a five minute question answer time in between. I will not take you to from now to ask questions. We'll take Q and A as we proceed. So we'll have questions in little while from now. I think that's the only way one can carry out web conferences. We'll allow an interim of for some five five minutes five minutes or so to put in questions and then proceed further. But if you continue the questions in the meantime, that would actually make it, I mean, it difficult to scroll up to see the question. So back to the point, I will once again repeating that even in case of a going concern sale during liquidation, section 53 is still completely relevant uh, because the liabilities then become change in liquidation estate and the money realized sale of the business is going concern becomes a part of liquidation estate. So from the liquidation estate, the liabilities will be settled. There can be no other meaning to a liquidation of an entity. Liquid going concern sale is one of the modes of liquidation. I can liquidate either by selling the assets piecemeal. I can liquidate the business by selling the assets by way of a slum sale. I can liquidate the business by doing a going concern transfer. So going concern transfer is nothing but a mode of selling. And therefore the concept, the, the whole uh, Schematics of insolvency cannot be changed merely because you have chosen the going concern mode of transfer as opposed to a slum sale or piecemeal sale. That's what I'm saying. However, if the liquidator instead of going for liquidation moves to section 230, section 230 scheme of arrangement. So if you move for section 230, then we are out of insolvency law altogether. Section 230 is not a not an insolvency framework. Section 230 is inter-creditor or debtor-creditor arrangement that becomes a mutual agreement between the debtors and creditors, sanctioned by shareholder resolution, sanctioned by creditor resolution and of course approved by the MCLT. So if we move to a scheme of arrangement, then the whole concept of insolvency jurisprudence does not apply there because we are not into framework of insolvency anymore. We moved out of insolvency and we are into a debtor-creditor agreement. So that, that is almost like CDR. It's like that restructuring with the consent of creditors. Of course, we take the sanction of every class of creditors because in section 230, we have inherently the concept of classes of creditors as well. So in section 230, the relevance of section 53 of insolvency code does not remain anymore because we're anyway into the, the not even into the insolvency framework. So I was just talking about this and I would therefore now I spent a bit more time in explaining this, that the concept of distributive justice, why am I, I mean, reiterating, reiterating this point, because in the star steel ruling as well, the Supreme Court has discussed this point quite a lot. And prior to that, the rulings of NCLAC, which obviously were overruled by the Supreme Court, the Atari steel as well as the star steel ruling, the Supreme Court, uh, the, the NCLAC had uh, kind of expressed some reservations about relevance of section 53, to the resolution plan. But both the Supreme Court's ruling and the, the amendments to the code, the relevance of Section 53 to a resolution plan becomes extremely important. And what Section 30 by 2, as I was mentioning, does say is that you cannot deviate from the principles of equity and fairness. I say that this uh, provision to Section 30, subsection 2 that I was mentioning, which uses the word fair and equitable. Fair and equitable to each class of filters. And I was saying, is it a, is it a dealing provision or is it an overarching requirement? Does the lawmaker expect that every resolution plan must abide by the condition of fairness and equity? Or does the lawmaker expect that once the COC has approved the plan, 
we deem it to be fair and equity. Is it a needing friction or is it a requirement? In my view, this is not something that's a deeming friction. It cannot be deeming friction because no resolution plan can ever deviate from the principles of fairness and equity because a resolution plan implies what in US parlance we call the concept of cramming down. Cramming down. Cramming down means what? A resolution plan is sanctioned by the majority and it, force, it, it is forced upon everyone. It is forced upon the, the, remaining, the remaining creditors. It is also forced upon the rest of the creditors. For example, in the COC what we have is only financial creditors. But the resolution plan is, is applicable to all the creditors. It is applicable to operational creditors. It is binding even to the government. So it becomes binding on everyone even though sanctioned by the financial creditors only. So cram down provisions which actually inherit from the US law, the concept of fairness and equity is also inherent in section 1129B. 1129B is the section from which the concept of cram down comes. And the provision of 1129B of the US bankruptcy code, read it with 1129A by 7. 1129B is the cram down provision. 1129A by 7 would seem to be very similar to what we have in India to say that you cannot pay to any creditor less than the liquidation value. So the minimum protection for every creditor is that you cannot promise to pay him less than the liquidation value. I'll just take a quick example to illustrate the point once again. But the section, uh, section 30 read with the US bankruptcy code and the UK law becomes a very important provision. So what we have, what we are calling this is horizontal and vertical equity. A resolution plan cannot breach the principles of horizontal and vertical equity. Horizontal and vertical equity. I think let's first start with horizontal equity. That becomes very important. From there you can move the concept of vertical equity. Horizontal and vertical equity is a very key term. This term is not invented by me. This term is there very commonly used in US law. And the same term is used in UK law by several rulings of UK courts as well. Find in the slide some of the rulings I have referred to. But let's first talk about horizontal justice. Let's suppose we have a resolution plan which is involving say three creditors. Creditor A, B, C are the three creditors, all of all of which are part of the resolution plan. And say in terms of the all these three are pari pass. Pari pass to that is of similar ranking in terms of their security interest. Can the plan promise to pay 60% to A? 70% to B and 70% to C. My creditors, the creditors are of the same ranking. Creditors have the same parity in the security hierarchy. Can the resolution plan pay less to some and more to some? But I have no doubt, if I have no problem if a particular creditor agrees to take a lesser value. But the question is one of cramming now. I agree to take a lower value, this is a different issue. We are on the question of cram now. Can a resolution plan force a creditor to take better than what the PO or other creditors of same ranking have, have have? So that's the concept of horizontal equity. That people placed in the same ranking, we cannot discriminate between people of same or similar. That's what is called horizontal equity. Now the little more tricky part is the vertical equity. So now just seen the graph also, the concept of vertical equity. Vertical equity means what? What is the worst for an uh, entity? Like what is worst for me? What's worst for everyone? The worst for everyone or anyone is death. Similarly, the worst for a company is liquidation. What is death for human beings becomes liquidation for legal entities. So we're talking worst come worst, what would happen if you do not agree on resolution, the entity moves into So in liquidation, how much will I get? So that brings me to the lower part of my scheme where screen that says if the company moves to liquidation, these three traders, trader ABC, they will be able to realize a security interest either inside liquidation or outside liquidation, they'll be able to realize security interest. And in that case, the total claims are say 500 crores and the value of the assets is expected to 250 crores. So what are we therefore saying is that if the claims are adding up to 500 crores, the value of assets is 250 crores, these traders, each three of these, will probably get 50% each. Now, can the resolution plan promise to pay to any one of them lower than 50%? 50% is what? 
50 percent is what I would get in the world liquidation with liquidation. So that's 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 what I therefore call the liquidation value of my liability. Liquidation value of the liability is what the total estimated value of that is. If it was to be distributed in terms of parties of section 53, how much will I get? A would have got 50 percent in terms of in terms of liquidation. Can he be promised to pay anything less than 50 percent? In a resolution plan, so that is the case of what you like. No resolution plan can ever deviate from principles of horizontal equity, vertical equity, because that's the concept of fairness and justice, which is coming in that explanation one. I just refer to that as is it a unique provision or is it an overarching requirement? By reference to global laws, I can easily say that's an overarching requirement because one cannot expect any resolution plan to be anything other than Fair and equity. And probably also see this is also coming very coming very clear from the ruling of Supreme Court in the SRC ruling. So the concept of vertical equity or horizontal equity has been discussed in several UK rulings. Some of these rulings you can see on my screen. But I will not spend time reading those uh, case references. I will, however, take take some examples of what may not be regarded as fair or equity. If I am a secure filter, I have a security interest. Can a resolution plan provide that I will be an unsecured filter? Can a secure filter become unsecured filter in terms of a resolution plan? Or can a senior become a junior filter? For example, somebody was let's say ranking senior in terms of ranking of secure filters. Somebody was of a senior ranking. Can he be made parry pass or can or for example can rights against third parties? Let's say I have a right party normally is what? Normally is a guarantor. I have a right against the guarantor. I have a right against the corporate and I have a right against the guarantor as well. Can my rights against the guarantor be obliterated or eliminated by way of the resolution? Can the resolution plan eliminate or obliterate my rights against the against the third party? If it does, that is also breaching the concept of fairness and equity because that's not expected uh, from a resolution plan to deviate from principles of equity, uh, this equitable distribution. No resolution plan can ever deviate from principles of equitable dis equity or justice. That is one of the basic attributes of a resolution plan in terms of section 30 subsection 2. That's the very important point. And uh, uh, I think uh, since we'll talk about section 53 at great length uh, as, as we discuss further, let me just so draw reference to the Yunsik trial principles, which I am sure you will all agree they have been, the, been at the background of the drafting of the insolvency code in India. The BLRC has made elaborate references to the Yunsik trial principles. The Yunsik trial principles are only agreed upon, agreed upon principles of insolvency jurisprudence world over. So one of the very important extracts from the Yunsik trial principle, you can see it on the right hand side of my presentation. Yunsitra legislative guide. One of the principles of equitability is the objective of equitable treatment is based on the notion that in collective proceedings, what is collective proceeding? Collective proceedings. Resolution is a collective proceeding. Liquidation is a collective proceeding because we are proceeding collectively, we are not proceeding individually. A creditor could have taken individual action. If the creditor, that was always open to the creditor. He could have gone for a single issue. You could have gone for a surveyty action, but instead of going for individual actions, the creditors went for a collective action. So in collective proceedings, creditors with similar legal rights should be treated fairly. Creditors with similar legal rights should be treated fairly, receiving a distribution on their own claim in accordance with their relative ranking and interest. An insolvency law must therefore treat equal as equals and must also ensure predictability. Another very important feature of insolvency law is predictability. Predictability means what? When I enter into a contract, I am coming as a senior lender. Now suddenly the law should not come and make me junior. Suddenly the law should not come and say make me parallel with somebody. That is contractual, the freedom of a bargain, the freedom of contracting and the essential attribute of predictability that the law Cannot the law cannot spring a surprise and say you thought you were senior but you are actually not a senior. So that is that will take away contractual predictability 
and the very purpose of insolvency law, which is to promote credit, will get frustrated. Let's understand that the basic purpose of insolvency law after all is to promote the granting of credit. Insolvency laws are all about, I mean, um, promoting credit. So the priority in section 53, we are turning to section 53, we examine each of the clauses of section 53 very elaborately now. Uh, most of these priorities are very uh, easily known to you. We are talking about six basic priorities. And the last two are actually distributions to shareholders. So we will basically be concerned with the first six. The first six basically are what? Insolvency resolution process cost and liquidation cost. The first priority is insolvency 53 1A, insolvency resolution process cost and liquidation cost takes the first share of the waterfall. The second share of the waterfall is workmen schemes for past 24 months prior to liquidation commencement date and the claims of secured creditors. Which secured creditors? Those secured creditors who have relinquished their security interest. So secured creditors before they climb up the ladder of priorities and come under 53.1b, they should have actually relinquished their security interest. Well, of course, as we'll discuss a little later, a secured trader, a secured trader has the option of not relinquishing security interest and enforcing security interest outside the liquidation process, in which case he goes ahead and sells off the asset himself. To the extent it still remains unrealized, his claim will come and become a part of 53.1e. But 53.1b deals with uh, deals with subsecure cases who have relinquished security interest. That's 53.1b. 53.1c deals with employees claims other than workmen for a period of 12 months prior to liquidation commencement date. 53.1d is financial creditors who are unsecured. That's owed to unsecured financial filters. Please appreciate that this is the only place in section 53. 53.1d is the only place in section 53 where the word financial filter is used. Otherwise, in section 53, we have references to secure filters and unsecured filters. We do not have references to financial versus operational. 53.1d is the only place where a financial filter, even the one secure, is distinguished and put on a level above the claims of unsecured operational credits. So discrimination between financial versus operational, which is said to be a unique feature of Indian insolvency law, is not seen in section 53 except in 53.1d. And that brings us to 53.1e, government dues for 24 months prior to liquidation commencement date and remaining amount of unsecured creditors remaining after the enforcement action in terms of section 52. And 53.1f of course is remaining debts and dues, all remaining debts and dues. All the remaining debts and dues which have not been covered by each of the five clauses above will come in 53.1f. For example, workmen's dues for a period of longer than 24 months. If workmen's dues have been there for more than 24 months, 24 months dues will come as a part of 53.1b but the remaining amount will come in 53.1f. All operational credits will come in 53.1f. So whole lot of, I mean, all residual claims, which are claims on liquidation estate, other than from shareholders, they come and become part of 53.1f. This is another uh, important uh, rank or important rung in the order for 53.1f. Uh, but let's move on and examine each of these closely, but before that, I will just be very quickly placing on screen a comparative position of priorities under the insolvency bankruptcy code, which is what we've seen just now, and the companies at 1956 and the companies at 2013. The point I'm trying to highlight is that the insolvency bankruptcy code actually made a categoric departure from the priorities which were earlier there in the Companies Act. It made a very silent but extremely important departure. When I say very silent departure, what I'm trying to say is that this point was discussed very, 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 very slightly. It was just a slight discussion on the point <coughs> by the BLRC. And the BLRC made a ton of a change. A small little discussion, probably not more than three sentences. And the BLRC made a ton of a change. It's an extremely significant change almost made steadily, almost made silently by the BLRC, 
without probably even being noticed. But it's a very, very significant change. What is the change I'm talking about? Have a look at the priorities in, uh, in the company that Look at the company that 2013 and look at the part dealing with security. It's a very important change. It's very important notice. What is the change I'm talking about? See the priority to secure data as a part of uh, the company debt. The company debt to the right hand side it says debts due to secure data. Much of the debts due to such secure data as could not be realized by him because of the workman portion of his security. Manit, the only that much part of his security data is clean which could not be realized because the secure trader has to has to relinquish or has to release a any share for workman's claim. To the extent the secure trader could not realize his security interest because he has to cede a proportional share to workmen. Only that part takes the super priority under company that. So under company that the super priority to secure traders is not for the whole of the claims. The super priority is only to the extent of the portion which the secure creditor has to cede for workman's share. Because the penny to workman's share is a part of like as it is a part of uh, insolvency bankruptcy court. That's a, that's a global principle all over the world. But only that much part which which could not be which remains which remains unrealized because of ceding of the penny for penny to share for workman's portion, that much part climbs up the ladder and takes the first priority under the company debt. However, under IBC what happens? Under IBC we are not talking about that much part of security credit claims which is only remaining, which is only, which is, the, which is the proportional share going to workmen. We are talking about the entire debt to security credit. So it's a huge change, the, as I said the BLRC has not discussed it at length. The BLRC has got just a two or three sentences kind of discussion on this. But it made an extremely categorical change and moved to a regime where Secure filters are given first priority. In case they relinquish their security, so this is something which is uh, which is by by itself it's a big change, and it's not also something which is very commonly seen in insolvency laws of other countries. Are put comparatively the bankruptcy code, the UK insolvency law, and the Singapore law as well. But that discussion may not be taking a lot of our time because that's the philosophy of insolvency laws. We are not into questioning the philosophical foundations of uh, insolvency law. We are to implement that. But I wanted this, this very very phenomenal and very significant change which has been assured in by the BLRC is the concept of priority under the insolvency law. Now, when we talk about priority, we talk about priority from what? So, priority is the, is the outflow side. The outflows will go into a priority order as listed in section 53. What's the inflow side? If when you talk about when you talk about a funds flow or cash flow, we're talking about the inflows and we're talking about outflows. The outflows are section 53 priorities. Inflow, what all is forming part of the liquidation estate from which the priorities will go out. So section 53 is not complete by itself. Unless we link it with section 36, which is defining the contours of the liquidation estate. So, what are the contours of the periphery of the liquidation estate? What does it include? What does it not include? And it's very important to understand what it does not include, because to the extent the liquidation estate does not include something, those elements which are excluded, they go completely outside the uh, the priority list. Because those people can realize. I mean, of their own, without being concerned with the priority order at all. So now, the, what is not included in liquidation estate as per the law itself? First question, money held in trust. Any money held in trust is not a part of liquidation estate. What is the meaning of money held in trust? I'm simply a trustee. The money is not mine. It's not a deposit. The money is lying with me. The money has to stay separate. I have an obligation on account of returning the money. The money is linked with some particular asset. It's a secure, it's, it's a kind of money which I am, which is impressed with the character of a trust. I'm a trustee. I'm a fiduciary. In that case, the money is not mine because I cannot claim to be holding or cannot claim to be having beneficial interest in the money. Money held in trust 
is not a part of liquidation estate. There will be no need to say that even a security deposit sometimes, if the security deposit is linked with a particular asset or a particular obligation, and the asset itself is forming part of liquidation estate, in that case, a security deposit must go because it cannot be that the asset will be will not be returned to or the asset will not be disposed of as per the wishes of the depositor and still the deposit will become part of claim on liquidation estate that sounds inequitable. So quite often security deposits are also taken as money held in trust and therefore outside the liquidation estate. Bailment of assets, if the assets are not mine, the assets are simply in my possession, then also the assets are not part of liquidation estate. A third and very important exclusion, this is a very biggest, very important question and on this question we don't have a clear answer. We have an answer, but the answer is not a clear answer. By the way, in course of my discussion, I'll be having lots of questions where I would say we don't have a clear answer. Well, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, section 53 is as important, as intriguing, it's as enigmatic, and it's impossible to have clear answers on such a such a vital question as the question of priority. I mean, as long as courts continue to work and courts continue to discuss insolvency laws, the priority of section 50 will keep, keep coming back to courts. There would never be a time when we say we now come to rest. I mean, the questions of section 53 priorities have come to rest now. There will never be such a time. So all along for years and decades to come, courts will discuss and continue to uh, dilate and, uh, and, and, and dissect the provisions of section 53. This will be in perennial. But the point that I'm right now saying is there's an exclusion in section 36 by 4 which says amount held in provident fund, pension fund, or gratuity fund. Amount lying in a provident fund, pension fund, gratuity fund. I mean, on a plain reading, it becomes very clear. So, next time there's an amount lying in a provident fund, or pension fund, or gratuity fund. <coughs> that amount has already been demarcated. That amount is demarcated. It's not forming part of the funds of the company, it's an amount lying in an external fund, fund may be dedicated to the employees of the company, but the fund is external. So to that extent, since the money is already funded, the liquidator cannot claim, the liquidator cannot claim the fund to be a part of the liquidation estate. That's the plain reading of that section 36.4 dealing with amount held in provident fund, pension fund, gratuity fund. Now I'm sure you're all aware that there's been a ruling of um, first NCLT and then the matter moved to NCLAT and there have, there have been rulings thereafter from various NCLTs to say that even if, there is, if, even if the money has not been contributed, if the money has not been contributed, if it is not given its money to the fund, does that anyway reduce the rigor of the provision merely because the company is yet to contribute the money to the fund? That would mean it is an obligation on the part of the company to contribute the money to the fund the company has not funded the money, does it make the, the reach of, I mean, does, does it anyway allow, does it anyway enhance the boundaries of liquidation estate to include those amounts which were actually meant for being put into the so-called employee benefit funds. I mean, if you use the generic term employee benefit funds, the money has not been contributed, but the money was anyway due to be contributed. Can we say that the situation is any different when I've actually paid the money versus when I have not paid the money. This was the basis of the NCLEC decision, right? And um, well, I, I, I don't know whether that's the last word of the subject uh, because a huge amount of uh, controversy still exists on that. So that they might be question, what if the company does not have a fund? Having a gratuity fund or having a pension fund or having a super animation fund is not a statutory requirement. I can continue to pay gratuity employees retire or as an employee superannuate. I don't have to necessarily create a gratuity fund. Creation of a gratuity fund or gratuity provision is only a matter of leveling the liabilities. This is something probably which cannot have, have been properly been argued before courts because gratuity fund is merely a way of tackling or leveling the liability. I may not have a fund. So what if I don't have a fund, I am liable to pay gratuity still. So can I say all gratuity liabilities, irrespective of whether I have a fund or not, will not form part of Section 53 waterfall. It becomes a very categoric assertion to say that Section 53 
जो सेक्शन फिफ्टी थ्री स्टार्ट बाई से नॉट विथ स्टेडिंग एनिथिंग एल स्टडी एन जल्द मैं गुड थिंग इज सेक्शन फिफ्टी थ्री स्टार्ट विथ एल परवेजिव वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग वर्डेड नॉन ऑफ सेटिंग क्लॉज टू से नॉट विथ स्टेडिंग वॉट एवर इट डोंट लुक एट वॉट अदर लॉज से लुक एट जिस सेक्शन ओनली एंड बिकॉज इंसोलवेंसी लॉ इज एनी वे स्पेशल लॉ इंसोलवेंसी लॉ इज एनी वे रिसेंट लॉ एंड पैरहेप्स वी कैन ऑल्सो वी कैन ऑल्सो वी कैन ऑल्सो we can also understand that the blrc has full access to all the past litigations about whether it is a fund will form liquidation instead or not having seen all the past controversies of what will or will, or will not form part of liquidation estate blrc thought it fit to write section 53 which was supposed to be a single code for liquidation priorities despite that then collect comes to the to say that there are money which don't form part of liquidation estate section 53 is not applicable it's a very categoric assertion but to my mind that's still not the last word on the on the law probably the law has and i said something back that there's nothing called last word when it comes to section 53 because section 53 the last word will never be written and section 53 will continue to have a courts uh, uh, debating the meaning of uh, the various clauses but as far as equity fund and the employee benefit fund are concerned the concern uh right now is whether we talking about only those amounts which have gone to the fund or we talking about shortfall in contribution to the fund or we talking about shortfall in payment of gratuity itself i don't have a fund but is the gratuity fund is excluded from a gratuity payment is excluded from liquidation estate that's a unresolved question i don't have an answer to this question but let me as of now place the question maybe we can come back and discuss it further and i would like to quickly add that when we talk about liquidation estate the estate may be enhanced by anti avoidance powers estate is some every liquidator every resolution professor must try to enhance the estate by putting or, or bringing back those monies which have gone out of the estate please do understand that we are like you are like uh, trying to save a sinking ship when the ship is about to sink when the ship is about to sink the normal i mean intuition is try and uh, push try and put out property into different other vehicles this ship is going to sink so asset may be parked here asset may be parked there everyone does that all the time then hives of assets into different other vehicles so the the phenomenon of money having moved out of the company will be very common and the normal intuition is that I Travel back time of only two years. I cannot. I cannot travel beyond two years because the clawback time is limited by the law. It allows me to travel back only two years. Only two years. Uh, that also in case of so-called associated parties. But my submission very often is that we are we are not limited by section 43 and 45. You have another provision, section 49 and section 66. 49 is the case of deliberate trans transfers have been deliberate. the moment you are able to say deliberate transfers there is no question of limitation of time also there is no question of limitation of time when it comes to questioning the truth of if money has gone out of the liquidation estate by way of a transfer of an asset and i can question the truth of the transfer but i can say the was this a real was it a truly a transfer or was it a make believe transaction i can question the very Legality of the transfer. Let the sale was invalid. Let the sale is artificial. The sale is not a real sale. The sale is merely make believe. The sale is a contrivance. So there again, there is no there is no limitation. For me, the limitation of three years is not applicable because three years will start running from the date I came to know. And I came to know when I assumed the office of the liquidator or the resolution professor. So limitation will not be against me, and the two-year time frame of clawback. is relevant only for essential transfers or undervalued transfers it's not relevant for fraudulent transfers it's also not relevant where i can question the legality of the sale itself to give an example <clears throat> let's say i was the resolution professional of a non banking finance company i was the rp or liquidator of a non banking finance company some of which have started getting into resolution and liquidation these days let's say in the rp or rp non banking finance company one of the things i'll surely want to do 
is to examine the so called sales of receivables done by the company. Those transactions are structured as a sale, but are they truly speaking sale? The so called direct assignments or the so called securitization, whereby assets are taken off to other, uh, other uh, financial sector participants. It may be banks or it may be other investors. On the face of it, the transaction looks like a sale. But if I can question that this sale is not a true sale, this is not truly speaking a sale. It looks like a sale, it's made to look like a sale, but truly speaking, this is not a sale. It's a pure financial arrangement. In that case, in that case, that's a custom part of the judiciary. So if I can bring questions on the sale itself, the assets still become part of liquidation estate. As a resolution professional or liquidator, I think it's my profound duty to try and see how much assets can I bring back to liquidation estate by using whatever sophistry uh, is available at my disposal. So I will maybe proceed further to the various elements of uh, uh, the waterfall and discuss on each of these. So we're talking about six elements of the waterfall. The first element is CIRP cost. <clears throat> I can see that some many, very meaningful questions have been asked already. So I think it's time we can probably take a two minutes break to see if we, some relevant questions on what things form part of liquidation estate and what things don't form part of liquidation estate. One of the questions I can see is TDS collected from others. Let's say I am TDS collected. So I have collected tax from someone. And not deposited with the government. Can I say this is, this is a, can I say this is not for a part of liquidation estate because I am simply a trustee. This money cannot be mine. The TDS which I have collected from others cannot be mine because this is actually what? This is something that I am collecting for the purpose of depositing to the government. I am simply a collection agent here. So this money cannot be for, for a part of liquidation estate. In my view, to the extent of taxes collected from others, and not deposited, I become in the nature of a trustee. Similarly, to the extent of, let's say, provident fund deducted from salaries, to the extent of, let's say, any deduction made from employees, and I have made deduction already, so I am actually supposed to be now remitting the money to the fund, I here also become a, a sort of a trustee. I cannot claim the money as forming part of liquidation, uh, forming part of my estate. Different, however, will be the case with something like GST, I cannot say I'm collecting from the buyer because GST is actually the obligation of the supplier of goods and services. That I'm able to pass it on to someone in different issue. But I'm actually not a collection agent of the government. The tax is payable by the seller. It's, it's loaded on the selling price as a different issue, but the tax is the obligation of the seller itself. So the question of GST is not exactly comparable to a deduction of tax at source. That's a quick point for now. And I can see that there are, I mean, on the question of uh, assets forming part of liquidation estate or not, TDS was one question. I think several participants have asked this question. Um, I've also seen a question about no fund, gratuity fund is not maintained at all. This is a question coming from a very senior resolution professional himself. As I mentioned, that currently we are all uh, by the ruling of NCLAT in the case of Mojar Bayer. I'm not sure if there are further other rulings of NCAD on that, but the ruling so far is talking about a case where the company has failed to remit the money to the fund. That would mean it's a shortfall of contribution to the fund that, as per the ruling of NCLAT, with great respect, is not forming part of liquidation estate. The ruling is not talking about a situation where I don't have a gratuity fund or pension fund or provident fund, so to say, at all. That would mean if there's no superannuation fund or pension at all, then the shortfall is simply an obligation. Obligations on the part of the company cannot be equated with amount held in trust or amount not forming part of liquidation estate because a pure obligation is simply a liability. If a pure obligation is simply a liability, then it comes as a claim on the liquidation estate and therefore it can assume, it can take the priorities in section 53, but it will not be out of section 53. Um, these were some of the questions on liquidation estate. I just now think probably see there is uh, another question on TDS. Whatever TDS connection is used by CD and no balance is your date, then if TDS has been, uh, is used by CD, taxes have been collected and have been used by don't have funds. That, that's the question of shortfall of money. But the question still is that is the to the extent of TDS 
is it forming is it forming part of liquidation estate? If it is not forming part of liquidation estate, then that much money has to be kept out. That would mean it will not be distributed in accordance with priorities of section 53. This will stay outside section 53. That would mean that much money has to go back. I cannot claim that money at all. Once I'm able to realize that money, once I'm able to realize any of the, I mean any of the assets of the corporate debtor. From the liquidation estate, something which is not forming part of liquidation estate has to go out first. I will use section 53 only from liquidation estate. That would be something which is not part of liquidation estate is beyond me. That's, that's not even my money. And therefore, I have to separate, step, segregate that money first before I talk about distributing money in accordance with section 53. Uh, okay, these were some of the questions on what is not part of liquidation estate. Let's, there are, let's move on. There are other extremely, uh, very, very important questions still. So allow, allow me to proceed further. I can uh, probably see there are other questions as well. TDS, uh, et cetera, there were questions already. There are seven questions which have actually gone very, very high on the scroll and because those questions kept on coming as I kept on speaking. Okay, the 531A talks about CRP cost and liquidation cost. As I'm sure you're all aware, CRP cost include the following. Amounts due to suppliers of essential goods or services. Amounts payable to suppliers of essential goods or services. Recent amendment to insolvency court has brought another concept, critical supplies. Essential supplies and critical supplies are two different things now. Critical supply is only something that you are not, I mean that you should try not to not to interrupt, not to stop. Essential supply is something which is essential, which the provider of the relevant service also cannot stop. For example, if electricity is essential for business, the electric, electricity supply company cannot stop supplying electricity. If water is essential for you, the water supplying body cannot stop the connection because it's essential goods and services. These are essential. The relevant vendors of the services also cannot stop it. But though they cannot stop it, but the amount payable to them, becomes a part of insolvency cost because you cannot deprive the person of the money which you cannot stop also that's the amount payable to suppliers of goods and services which are considered essential out of pocket expenses incurred with rp expenses incurred and met by the rp which are uh, which are obviously part of uh, insolvency resolution cost fees payable to authorized representative of a class of it this basically has to do with real estate uh, buyers home buyers Amounts due to persons whose rights are prejudicially affected due to the moratorium. To give an example, for example, for your, your landlord, you are not paying renters to a landlord. You are not being able to pay rent to a landlord. He cannot throw you out because the moratorium affects his right to evict you also. So while he cannot throw you out, you are not being paying rent also. But that rent which is affected by the moratorium, that will become part of the uh, part of the first category. That would mean that will become part of insolvency resolution process cost. So I'm not talking about rent, rentals which have accrued so far. Rentals which were affected by the moratorium, that is moratorium period rentals will become part of insolvency resolution process cost because the relevant supplier cannot take action so as to throw you out. That's the first category. Other costs directly related to CRP and approved by the COC. There are other questions coming on the tax deduction, deduction at source, but I'll guess I'll proceed as of now and come back on these. As I mentioned earlier, <coughs> there's a difference between <coughs> essential supplies and critical supplies. Critical supply is not explicitly a part of CRP cost unless the COC takes them as a part of uh, CRP cost. Critical is basically critical so as to preserve the going concern nature of the corporate data. The IRP and RP has to continue to make those payments because those payments are critical. The idea is to ensure the going concern nature. But essential goods and services are basically defined to be electricity, water, telecommunication, and information technology. Uh, to the extent these are not direct input to the business of the entity. Then comes liquidation process costs, which also has several components. Uh, by the way, in the part of CRP, we also have something called interim finance. Interim financing is also a part of insolvency resolution process cost, not just the interest but the principal as well. The principal as well as the interest on account of interim funding will become part of CRP cost and therefore get super priority. Section 53 1A is a case of super priority. It's the first item in the waterfall 
and therefore super priority is given to interim financing. I am not sure whether interim financing has been practical at all. To best of my understanding, interim financing has not at all been practical <coughs> because uh, to best of my knowledge, most of the uh, financiers have not been eager or keen to provide funding and take it as a commercial line of business. I mean, VIP funding is a very promising line of business elsewhere in the world. But in India, somehow, interim financing has still not been critical. What are the factors uh, have, have, has not been practical so far? What are the factors which have stopped interim funding from being practical in India is a subject matter of separate examination. For now, we'll continue proceeding further. Elements of liquidation process cost, which is also part of 53 money. So fees of the liquidator, remuneration paid by the liquidator for professional services. Cost incurred for, for verification of claims. Cost incurred for protecting the assets of the corporate debtor. Cost incurred for carrying corporate debtor is going concern. Interest on interim funding. The principal is already part of CRP cost. The interest on interim funding. Amount payable to contribute fees. Amount payable to contribute to contributories to liquidation cost. If somebody has contributed to liquidation cost, what does that mean? And I'm sure you understand that recently, <coughs> um, for meeting liquidation cost as well, the concept of contribution by creditors came in. Creditors may be required to contribute to liquidation cost. My creditors are expecting to be paid by the liquidator. But instead, the liquidator may ask the creditors to pay. Liquidator may ask creditors to contribute to liquidation process by prepaying liquidation cost, which is a very strange thing though, but well, that, that's how the law has provided for contribution to liquidation cost from the creditor. So if at all the liquidator has called such contribution, then the return of the contribution will be super priority act. As a creditor, if I don't see the clear prospect of realizing something from the assets, no creditor will be happy to provide such contribution, particularly because the rate of interest which is promised by the law is only the bank rate. Bank rate is the bare basic bank rate. Interest at bank rate. Bank rate is, I'm sure you understand, bank rate is about 5.5% 5, 5, 5 or so. So bank rate is a very low rate. There's no motivation on the part of any creditor to provide contribution to liquidation cost. In any case, it's not mandatory. So this is something which is, uh, I think it's a uh, high level of optimism to think of creditors providing funding to meet liquidation costs. But anyway, that's also a part of Super Priority Act. I will very quickly be coming to the most important topic that I was wanting to spend time on is the amounts due to secured credits. Amounts due to sec uh, and, and I'm sure all of you would agree that the largest claimant, a largest claimant of both the resolution process or the liquidation process are the secure creditors. <clears throat> they are the biggest creditors. So what is the priority for secure creditors? And that's, a, that's an extremely important question. Now before we proceed further, let's say that there is a parity, there is a proportionality between the claims of workmen and the claims of secure creditors. So we need to be spending time on both workmen's claims and secure creditors' claims. Workmen's claims in terms of amount, in terms of sheer size, is mostly not very significant. In terms of size, workmen claims are not very high. But in terms of uh, in terms of uh, social value, I mean the social impact, it becomes a huge issue. If you're talking about the claims of those people who have spent their time on the company, they worked for the company, they're not being paid, their families are uh, are devastated, their houses are in big bad shape. These people have not been paid for years. And you're trying to decide on the claims of such people who have been waiting for years to get money from the liquidation estate. So that's, I'm saying, from part of your sentimental, emotional, or social dimension, it's a very, very sensitive issue. But in terms of amount, as compared to the claims of secured creditors, the claims of workmen are a paltry amount. I mean, in terms of size. As the workmen is used for the past 24 months, and the secured creditors' claims, in those cases where, the secured traders have relinquished the security. That brings us to the very important concept. First of all, what is the meaning of workman's claims? What is the meaning of workman? And what is the meaning of workman's dues? So workman is defined with reference to Industrial Disputes Act. Mostly what it means is manual unskilled uh, workers. The definition of work, workman is by and large settled. 
from the industrial disputes act and the meaning of wages what all will be the parts of wages so wages basically mean wages and salaries it also includes something like bonus allowance bonuses and will leave compensation for termination now that's a very important and extremely unresolved question once again termination payments if the entity slips into liquidation if a company slips into liquidation resolution has failed the company goes into liquidation by statute all the workers are supposed to be discharged i mean by deeming provision of law all workers all employees lose their offices the moment the company slips the passing of liquidation order itself is an order of discharge every creditor and sorry every worker every employee automatically becomes discharged uh, i have questions on the uh, on the financial credit i will be covering the financial credit but let's take questions on that and i will also see a comment from a participant saying please share the ppt that's not a problem at all i have no issues at all in sharing the ppt so that's something that i'll definitely be more than happy to share but let me come on the very important part of what is the meaning of workman claim and what's the meaning of claim of security on both the issues of what is the meaning of secure credit claim and what's the meaning of workman claim you'll find whole lot of issues and you'll find so many issues that probably will never i mean i think it will take years for us to reach to an ultimate answer to these questions the first question i'm saying is termination payment i was mentioning the very passing of the liquidation order it self amounts to discharge and therefore there is an automatic termination automatic termination happens by virtue of liquidation order are the workers entitled to a termination as provided in the industrial disputes act i guess the relevant section of industrial disputes act will be 25f or 25f so the question is in a liquidation situation are the workmen still entitled to termination payments as provided for by section 25f or 25 triple f the answer seems to be more hinging towards the yes answer that that after in the case of termination whether termination happens because of insolvency law or otherwise it's still a case of termination the workers have been deprived of the livelihood they've been deprived of a job opportunity and therefore it's fair that they should be compensated by way of a termination claim now this stuff if we say that the answer is yes that a termination though it happens because of liquidation will still entitle the workman to raise a claim for termination the question is is the termination payment also a part of wages and therefore assumes the priority of 531b roman 1 so this also the answer is clearly yes and because that's how it's very clearly covered by section 3262 explanation b roman 1 now please when you read the complete that make sure that you read the version which is post amendment by ibc because several of these committee provisions were amended by ibc itself and if you see the post amendment version of 3262 explanation b roman 1 it clearly includes compensation for loss of office loss of uh, loss of work also so there are two questions that we are discussing here number one whether if the charge happens by virtue of liquidation order does it entitle the workman to a termination claim no i'm saying the answer is not a final answer but this is how it seems because after all this is a question of loss of uh, employment there as well that's part 1 and part 2 if it becomes a part of termination claim then this termination claim also takes the same priority as wages by virtue of 3262 explanation b roman 1 i do understand there are people who are uh, giving their opinions on the termination point i mentioned uh i'll come back to this uh, observation give me two minutes before i discuss the secure claims also and then we'll come to questions on this particular issue moving forward this is the most important part of our discussion secure credit <coughs> i am raising a big question what is the meaning of a secure credit now you probably say what is this we are talking about i mean mature seasoned insolvency professionals who been handling insolvency over years now and we ask me a strictly fundamental question what is the meaning of a secure credit but i think this question itself can take hours and hours of discussion time without ultimately reaching the finality what is the meaning of a secure credit now why am i raising this question so let's try sequencing the the line of argument so in order to understand i have a claim from a secure credit 
we need to answer the we need to answer the following questions first is this person is the claimant a creditor first of all is the claimant a creditor if the claimant is a creditor is he a secured creditor what is the meaning of secure creditor in section 330 and 3 by 31 the word security interest and the word secured creditor are defined 3 by 31 is the relevant section because 3 by 30 defines the secured creditor as a person only security interest and 3 by 31 gives examples of security. 3 by 31 does not define what security interest is. 3 by 31 gives illustrations. For example, it says hypothecation, mortgage, charge, pledge. It goes to say encumbrance also. So it just gives illustrations of security interest, but it does not define what is security interest. Now I'll talk about several situations. Now think of, let's say, think of a person who has borrowed money and the lender created what is called a negative negative lien lender created negative lien saying what that here are some assets you will not dispose of the asset unless you pay me you're not saying that i have a right to say those assets will not be disposed of unless my claim unless my loan or my liability is squared off until you pay me you cannot dispose of that. that's what is commonly referred to as negative lien or it could also be a case of negative pledge. So does a negative lien or negative pledge also want to security interest? Normally the answer would be no. Similarly, as a mere obligation to pay, somebody is agreeing to pay. For example, a guarantor comes and says, I will pay. Is obligation to pay is the same thing as obligation as obligation attached to property. What is the charge? A charge of security interest is actually an obligation attached to property. There's a property. The obligation is fastened or attached to a property. That would mean if I don't pay, then this property will pay. The moment you fasten or attach the obligation to a particular property, that's when the claim becomes not a claim against a person. It becomes a claim against property. And a property claim is what I'll call a charge or a mortgage. A mortgage, a mortgage goes even beyond that. A mortgage becomes a case of Transfer of property also. But let's not get into the decision between mortgage and charge. If we generalize the word security interest, a security interest is an obligation attached to property. A mere obligation to pay, a personal obligation to pay, is not a case of a charge. Similarly, a covenant requiring requiring maintenance of an asset cover. For example, say to a debenture holder, I issue debentures, and to debenture holders, I say I will maintain asset cover. Now, asset cover maintenance requirement by itself is not a case of charge. I will maintain a particular asset cover. I am not saying the assets are charged to you. A mere asset cover requirement or mere maintenance of certain financial covenants will not be a case of charge. A charge has to be an obligation attached to property. That's the first point. Second point, let's assume a case, though it's not a very, uh, it's not a very common case, but let's assume a case where there's a charge created by the company. But the charge has not been filed by the company with registrar of company. Charge has not been filed with ROC. Section 77 filing is not done. Can, can, the, can the company take or can the liquidator take cognizance of this charge and treat the creditor as a secure creditor? Uh, you probably see section 77 by 3 is very clear on that. That a charge which is not registered shall not be taken cognizance of by the liquidator. That would mean for the liquidator, this charge is non-existing. There's no charge at all. I'm not saying there's no claim. The claim is still there. But the claim is not claim of a secure credit because the security interest is missing. So it becomes from 53.1b, it moves to 53.1d, d for delta. From beta, it comes to delta. That would mean there's no security interest at all. Therefore, this charge cannot be recognized as a secured a security interest. Next question that is very important is determining what is security interest. Security interest on ascertainable assets or security interest on unascertainable assets because as I was mentioning earlier, the moment we talk about liquidation value, we have to say what is the value attributable to a particular creditor. And for finding the value attributable to a particular creditor, we talk about what are the assets backing up the creditor. So are we, does the secure creditor have identifiable assets backing his claim? For example, does the security, does the secure creditor have a charge on a particular property? Or does he have what is called a pari charge on all the assets of the company? 
You see, most common cases are a peripheral charge on all the significant future assets of the company. You'll find it very common situation in India is to have a loan agreement which says a charge on all the present and future assets of the company. I mean, the director feels very happy. I mean, saying all pervasive charge. I mean, in the world, whatever is happening, there is no one can say that. What is saying that you have whatever is happening. So that's what I call all pervasive charges, enterprise-wide charges. In legal parlance, we call it a case of floating charge. Typically speaking, a charge on unattainable is a floating charge. And so why is the why is the distinction between fixed charge and floating charge is relevant? I mentioned earlier that we also have to ranking. And I will come to a very important point, and, and, and you probably all appreciate, I do understand that this point may be a very sensitive point. It's a very sensitive, very important point. But I think this webinar is all about making important points. I did mention section 53 is very important. And I also mentioned that I'm not contending, I'm not claiming that end of this webinar, we will have answers to these extremely important questions. I have to again reiterate, I most humbly reiterate that these are questions which for the past 100 years, they have not been over the next 100 years also, we'll probably not be able to resolve because these questions are perennial questions. I'll, I'll, I'll mention what question I'm talking about. So I'm talking about is the, what is the ranking of this filter? So ranking could be of two types. Ranking could be CDO versus GDO. For example, first charge holder, second charge holder. We have first charge holder, second charge holder. We also have something called subservient charge. First charge, second charge. And sometimes you also say subservient charge. Subservient charge meaning what? This charge is on what is left over. Subservient charge. But by definition, even a second charge is subservient charge because second charge is not charge on the asset. Second charge is not a charge on the asset. Second charge is charge on what is left over after paying the first charge holder. For example, if the value of an asset is 10,000 rupees, the first charge holder has a let's say claim of 6,000 rupees. And second charge holder also has a claim of less than 6,000 rupees. The second charge holder's claim is not on the asset. It's on the value of the first charge holder. That's the meaning of the second charge. But very often people also use a word called subservient charge, which is actually even subservient to the second charge. So that's the first charge, second charge, subservient charge. Or they can be a senior lender. Uh, senior lender, they could be a subordinated lender also. There are sometimes also cases of subordinated claims. Subordinated claims are claims which are subordinated even to an unsecured lender. This practice is common among banks and financial institutions to have a subordinated debt SDI. But that's not mostly relevant for others. But in financial sector, there are subordinated claims also. So we need to determine the ranking goals. And why do we have to do all of that? Because in order to treat a secured trader at par in the liquidation process, we need to know what the ranking of the secured traders are. Now, this question of ranking becomes so very important that I actually have to spend a little time on that. <coughs> and I'm therefore referring to some discussion in the ILC Insolvency Law Committee report. This is the second report of Insolvency Law Committee. Uh, sometime in month of February 2020, I've uh, given the citation of the report as well. And this report has a very important point. Para 7.1 to 7.4 of the report talks about a very significant point. It says repayment to secured traders covers the value of security interest relinquished. What the ILC is saying is that the idea of section 53.1b is to compare the situation with section 52. Section 52 and section 53.1b are the two options available to a creditor. A creditor may go under section 52, sell off the asset fixes and realize the value of that. Other option for him is to go under section 53.1b relinquish security interest and claim the money from liquidation estate. So the question is that there must not be there must not be a disparity between the between the the width or the range of the claim, the outreach of the claim of the security creditor under section 52 versus section 53 1B. Take an example. Let's say I have a claim of 10,000 rupees and I have an asset backing up the claim. The value of the asset is say for a minute 100, 100 rupees. I have a claim of rupees 10,000 which is backed by an asset. I am exaggerating example to make the point clear. 
I have a claim of rupees 10,000. The claim is backed by security interest over the asset. The asset value currently is rupees 100. Now, I say I am relinquishing my security interest and making the asset available to the liquidator. And I will file my claim. I will file my claim for how much value? Obviously, I will file a claim for 10,000. Can I see my 10,000 rupees of security creditors claim? Can the secure creditors claim parity along with other secure creditors? To the extent of 10,000 rupees, though the value of the asset backing his claim is only 100 rupees. So what I'm actually doing is, I'm throwing into liquidation estate an asset worth rupees 100 and claiming parity with others to the extent of 10,000 rupees. Does it sound equitable? Had I gone for section 52 and sold off the asset outside liquidation, I would have been able to raise only 100 rupees. So I'm soft, I mean, I'm, I'm enhancing my claim from rupees 100 to make it 10,000 merely by relinquishing security interest. That doesn't sound equitable at all. So there's a clear and stark difference between the amount of the claim and the asset backing up the claim. In that case, the secured creditor can be taken as secured only to the extent of value of the security interest. This is exactly what is coming from the ILC report. The ILC report says that this point is clear enough. In fact, the suggestion was that insolvency bankruptcy code may be amended to make it clear. But the ILC report in these paragraphs 7.1 and 7.4, it goes to say that there is no need to clarify this point because this point is clear enough. Now, I am guessing that the point may not be clear to all your people. This point has never been, I mean, settled, uh, uh, as far as my understanding is concerned, the point is not settled even now. Even after the ILC report, it was settled. But I guess from the participants assembled here, if you realize that when you talk about value of security interest claims, you actually have to go back into the security interest backing up the claim <clears throat> and take only such assets or such value as is the value of the security interest. Because then the secure creditors claim will be split in two parts. The secure creditors claim will be split in two parts, unsecured part and secure part. You can see the distinction, similar distinction in the provisions dealing with individual insolvency in section 110.3b and section 123.2b. This is a very important point, but I do understand that very not actually, based on this very important point, the point is that if there are undersecured creditors, I mean, the extent of security interest and the claims are disproportionate among it. Across creditors, we have disproportionate amount of claims and disproportionate value of assets. And everybody is relinquishing their uh, their assets to the, to the liquidation pool. In that case, we cannot treat everyone at par because the penalty will then be based on the extent of security interest relinquished by the secured creditor. This is exactly what is coming from the report of the insolvency law committee that I referred to. I'll maybe take an example also to illustrate that. Let me make a little quick move here. I realize that we have just about 20 minutes or so left. I'll take an example to illustrate the point I'm trying to say. The third priority comes to major employee claims. I think the unfortunate bit, um, unfortunate part of most of the real life insolvency proceedings in India as of now, resolution or liquidation proceedings is that the value of the assets is not enough even to pay category number two, that is even to pay the secure creditors itself, if there's insufficiency at 53.1b, the question of distributing anything at all to 53.1c or 53.1d, etc., will not arise at all because we will exhaust all the money paying off 53.1b. So rest of the discussion might become completely theoretical, but we'll still have to discuss that. For example, 53.1e includes the central government and state government dues, so all taxation liabilities come under this. And this has now been clear uh, from rulings of NCLEC as well, that uh, um, claims of the government are operational claims. And they rank at par with 53.1e, because that's the priority given to central government and state government. Uh, then comes 53.1f, which is all residual claims covered under 53.1f. G and H, of course, will be payments to preference shareholders and equity holders. That is not expected to be as a part of the insolvency uh, scenario. We are talking about bankrupt liquidation. So, question of the payments to preference holders or equity holders will most likely not be there. 
I'm taking the classroom example to illustrate the distribution of the work. This is obviously far from reality. The example that I've taken is far from reality. This example is a contrivance to explain the point because in real life, in most cases, the claims of secure credit will take away largest part of the entire sheet. But anyways, for the sake of illustration, I put in the, the different items of claims are insolvency resolution process cost 200 rupees, liquidation cost 400 rupees, workman's claims in past 24 months 1000, workman claims beyond last two years, that's 500 rupees. Workman claims are split in two parts, last 24 months claims and more than last 24 months claims, that's 1000 and 500 respectively. Employee claims likewise, likewise are past 12 months 3000, more than past 12 months 600 rupees. Government deals, let's say 1,500 within two years and beyond two years, 1,500 and 1,000 respectively. Secured FTs, I was thinking costing and the word used here is secured FT. But for the purpose of 531B, it does not matter whether the creditor is FC or OC. All that we need is secured creditor. We are not distinguishing between secured financial and secured operational credit. A secured credit is secured credit. Nevertheless, let's assume that we have secured financial credit. <coughs> those who are relinquished security is 2,800. There are also those creditors who went ahead under section 52 to sell off assets specifically charged to them. By the way, do understand that it will not be advised for a creditor to use section 52 and sell off assets if the claims of the lenders are on peripheral assets which have still good value. The creditors might be surface even otherwise. The creditors might have used Surface Act even otherwise than go and sold assets. But assuming the creditors have not done that, <coughs> they have not used Surface And in the meantime, resolution proceedings started. Nothing stops them from using Surface Once liquidation is uh, on, they can also use Section 52 and I mean, use Section 52 itself to sell off assets which are specifically charged to them. So 52 is a good tool for those creditors who have a specific security interest. Of course, for parity cash security interest, question of section 52 to my mind, I mean, though the law says that you can actually dispose of assets separately, but if you have parity cash security interest, question of using section 52 to my mind becomes completely irrelevant. But nevertheless, let's say there are those who sold off assets. Item number 10 is for those who sold off assets outside liquidation. Their residual claim is rupees 300. Unsecured FC, let's say 200. Other than that, let's say 100. And then we got reference shareholders and equity shareholders, which anyway will not be of any relevance. Now, all these claims put together, we are first trying to see what are the total amount of claims falling under each of the categories. So, under category 1, 531A, we have two claims there insolvency resolution process cost, CRP cost, and liquidation cost, 200 and 100 respectively, adding up to rupees 300. So, rupees 300 is the claim under 531A. Then comes 531B, we got two claims, workman's dues for past 24 months and secure filters who have relinquished security interest, say rupees 2,800. I'm assuming that these filters are those whose value of security interest was not highly disproportional. That would be either they had very personal security or their respective security interests were not inter se disproportional. So we've taken the claims as claims. We have not taken the unsecured part of the claim or the secured part of the claim. So we've not distinguished between the claim amount and the unsecured part. We take the entire part as 2,800. I'm assuming that for now, for sake of synthesis, 2,800. So the ratio between the workman's claim and credit claims, SC secured credit claims, is 5 versus 14, 5 is to 14. You can see 1000 is to 2800, that makes it 5 is to 14. Employees claims are 3000, unsecured FCs are 200, government dues 1500, and the unrealized amount of secured credits would be 300. I think with this we can probably proceed because we may not need to go even beyond that. Now let's see the distribution. First scenario, supposing we are able to realize to be 4500, good amount. And actually, we'll be able to settle a whole lot of uh, the claims. So from the first 4,500, we first of all need the 531A part, which is 200 plus 100, so rupees 300 goes up. We are now left with 4,200, 30 plus 2 part, 531B. 
So the money is sufficient to pay off the entire 53 b we pay off the entire one. Then we go to 53 c employees dues. That's where the money gets completely exhausted. We will not be able to go beyond that. Scenario 1 O. Go to scenario 2, a much worse scenario. Let me realize only 2200. So we'll first pay 53 a There might be cases where uh, the realization is not sufficient even for the there may be cases where the money is not enough even to pay liquidation cost and CRP cost. In that case, what do we do? So, I will go back to that inside a class, 53.1a is a class, 53.1b is a class. Inside a class, unless there is prioritization, everybody is supposed to be at par. So, liquidation cost, CRP cost, etc., etc. If there is a shortfall there as well, we'll have to allocate the money proportionally to each of the credits. To the extent we have not already paid them, if there are remaining amounts still, there will be proportional allocation inside a class. Then we come to part two, which is the parity person share of workmen and security creditors. The total amount, we call the proportion was 5 is to 40. We have total amount of 1,900 left, which is obviously proportionally split. 500 rupees goes to workmen. Security creditors get 1,000. Workmen's total claim was 1,000. They get rupees 500, that is they get 50%. Similarly, the secured creditors claim was 2,800, they get 1,400, they also get 50%. So each of the secured creditors are getting 50%, so also the workman. Now, let me just do a small um, change here. Let's assume among the claimants who came as secured creditors, 2,800 rupees worth of claims of secured creditors, there was a senior creditor, let's say rupees 2,000, and there was a second charge holder, say rupees 800. That 2800 consistent, consisted of two creditors, of which one was senior, second was a second charge holder. First charge holder rupees 2000, second charge holder rupees 800. Now, are we therefore going to allocate rupees 1400 in the second scenario of two? Are we going to allocate 1400 proportionally to the first charge holder or second charge holder? Or are we going to pay everything to the first charge holder first and then the remaining amount goes to second charge holder? The answer is quite clear. Inside the class of secured FC, which is 1400, to the right hand side, at the right hand extreme side, you can see here, inside here, this part, 1400. Inside this part, <coughs> we're talking about this part. Inside 1400, we have allocated 1400 to 531B Robert 2. Now this 1400 will first go to the first charge holder. The first charge holder inside the category of secured creditors is itself senior. So out of this 1400, the entire 1000, or see we said 2000 is the, supposing this 2800 rupees claim, rupees 2000 is say the first charge holder, so say rupees uh, so let's say this claim is first charge holder rupees 2000, second charge holder rupees 800. In that case, from the realization of 1400, the entire amount of 1400 will go to the first charge holder. Everything will go to the first charge holder. Nothing will be paid to second charge holder, even though the second charge holder also forms part of 531B. So question is, inside the secured creditors category as well, there may be mutual priorities. Now the moment I talk about mutual priorities here, it becomes easy for me to bring in the concept of floating charges. Floating charges. Supposing the claims of 2800, the same amount of 2800 that we talked about earlier, let's say now I change this a bit and say, this uh, 2800 consists of two types of creditors, say, Fixed charge holder, fixed charge, charge is specific as a fixed charge, rupees 2000, floating charge, on the same method, rupees 800. What's the meaning of floating charge? A floating charge is a charge on unassertainable assets. A floating charge is not necessarily subordinated to fixed charge. The subordination of floating charge to fixed charges itself is an extremely complicated question, but the normal the normal uh, principle, which is uh, almost 100 years old and has been written in I mean, hundreds of court rulings 
uh, reaching right up to House of Lords in UK and Supreme Court in India, hundreds of rulings, which were talked about the mutual priorities between six charge holders and floating charge holders, is that if the floating charge was flexible enough, the floating charge was flexible and allowed the char allowed the allowed the company to dispose of the assets without the intervention of the charge holder. In that the company is not precluded from creating fixed charges also. I mean, suppose you think of a charge on, let's say somebody says, and obviously leaves the company to sell off the assets comprised within the floating charge. If the company can sell off the assets, the company might as well create an encumbrance or the company might create a fixed charge also. So if the company has created fixed charge, despite the prudence of a floating charge already, but that floating charge was flexible and allowed the company the autonomy and the liberty of creating or disposing of assets or creating encumbrances, I have done that. In that case, the fixed charge will take priority over the floating charge. I am repeating, repeating a very significant point once again. That normally speaking, if a floating charge allows the liberty to create a fixed charge or to dispose of the assets covered by the floating charge, and in pursuance of that or flexibility, the company has created a fixed charge, even though the fixed charge is on a date subsequent to the floating charge, the fixed charge will still take priority over the floating charge. This is coming from, as I mentioned, some hundred years of rulings of courts in India and in England, as also in Australia. The mutual priority is between fixed and floating charge. Next comes the question of priority between a charge created on different dates. So if the charges are not as such prioritized, then normally speaking, your earlier charge will have a priority over a subsequent charge. This is coming from the TPS as well. If the asset is already charged, and then I create a further charge on that very asset, unless the charge is made to be a parry pass, for example, with the concurrence of the charge holder, if the charge is not a parry pass charge, then normally speaking, the subsequent charge will be subordinated to the existing charges. So the the law of priorities of security interest is an extremely complicated, it's a very, very tricky, very, very complicated law. Um, uh, today, uh, we probably might have uh, touched upon the fringes of this very complicated law. I do understand that a whole lot of discussion is still required. I have talked about the fixed and floating charges uh, in context of IBC. IBC has not made a reference to floating charges at all. IBC has not referred to floating charges at all. Though the Company Act 2013 and the Company Act 1956, both the, both the sections about priorities had a specific reference to things. Somehow, whether, uh, whether with knowledge, without knowledge, the discussion on public charges did not form a part of the BLRC report at all. I, to, my mind, to my understanding, the concept of floating charges has not been discussed by BLRC at all. Does that mean floating charges? This concept is not relevant for insolvency at all. I would not agree on that. As I mentioned, this even though falling under 53 B is still respected. And we also have a Supreme Court ruling in the case of Sinko letters on that. We have rulings of uh, rulings under IBC as well, both from the NCN as also from NCLAT. And we have rulings of Supreme Court also. It's a very settled issue that internet of IT, that was the key principle of Juncetral. I highlighted earlier. Interpret of priority will still be respected in insolvency. But insolvency is not something which goes to kill interpret of priority. It prevails insolvency. The priorities will remain. And therefore, if there was a prioritization between the fixed charge holders and the charge holders, the fact that IBC has not made a specific mention of floating charges does not obviate or does not negate the principle. That would mean that priority will still remain. So to my mind, that priority is still there, and I have discussed the the law about uh, secure creditors. I did mention that 52 versus 53 are the two options available to a secure creditor. The secure creditor can go to section 52, sell off the asset after liquidation, or can join the liquidation process by relinquishing security interest. The third option, which is winding up laws of, laws of, uh, winding up laws of uh, pre pre IBC era. Which is to say that I'm actually not relinquishing security interest, but I am allowing the liquidator to dispose of the assets. I mean, the common view taken by people earlier was that the security I am not relinquishing. However, I'm merely permitting the liquidator to call 
and my security interest now shifts from the asset to the money. I had a charge of the asset earlier. Now my charge shifts to the money realized by sale. That option of, I mean, either we are relinquishing but still permitting or not relinquishing, still permitting the asset. That option is completely, I mean, not within the explicit provisions of IBC. The IBC is talking about only two things. Either you keep the security interest in sale of the asset or you relinquish security interest and let the asset be part of the petition estate. And of course, there is a DV provision for relinquishment also now. Regulation now say that if you don't act within time, then you are deemed to have relinquished security interest. I have talked about the general rules of priority of fixed versus floating charges. And in this case, looking at uh, the fact that it's almost 5 o'clock, it's actually 5 o'clock now, I would uh, see what are the questions that can be tackled in this case. I saw lots of questions that actually come, and uh, let me see what are the questions which we can tackle in this case. Uh, okay, <clears throat> participants may maybe if you want to type further questions, write further questions, you can put the questions at this stage. But I'll leave that keep scrolling up to see what questions can be taken up immediately. I have a question from Mr. Narayan who says secure creditors will be secured even if the value of security is less than the means of secure creditors. That's precisely what I was mentioning as Narayan. I was referring to the report of the ILC and I would request everyone to read this ILC report very carefully. There are 7.1 to 7.5 of the second ILC report of Feb 2020 which discusses the point and says that it would be wrong and it would defeat the principle of equitable treatment if a secured creditor could have a claim disproportional to the value of the security. Because otherwise, you might have very, I mean, exaggerated situations. For example, I have a claim of 1 lakh rupees, I have a claim on asset of 100 rupees, I very generously say I have relinquished security interest on 100 rupees asset, so it is a part of liquidation estate and become a claim to the extent of 1 lakh that would create complete inequitability. So that's, that's something which ILC report says that your claim cannot exceed the value of the security interest. Uh, let me see the question put by Mr. Devrata Mahapatra. He is saying good afternoon. So good afternoon back to Mr. Mahapatra. Mr. Nanavati says goods that have been seized by excise department of account of unpaid dues. Um, can, excise, can, can the excise department be considered considered secure data. Seizure itself does not make the excise department a secure data. For, for, for treating the excise department as secure data, there must be something called registration of security interest. By the way, the provision of the Surfacy Act. Surfacy Act has a similar provision for registration of attachment. Surfacy Act allows registration of an attachment also. If the government has, government has done a seizure, government has not done attachment. If the excise department has done attachment and the excise department goes ahead and notifies the attachment under, I guess, that section 26C or 26B of Surface. Surface Act has 26B to 26E are important provisions of Surface Act, one of which talks about registration of an attachment also. Notification of the attachment and registered that with Sursai, Sursai is the central registry, it can then be argued that everyone who is aware of this attachment and therefore the claim of the excise department can probably stand, but a mere seizure will not mean security interest as such. Uh, <clears throat> Unspaced telling to employees during CRP period and during plan implementation stays, is it a part of the cost or not? On this question of unpaid salaries during CRP period, um, my colleagues have done an uh, elaborate write-up and I think it's a very important point that if the, if the resolution professional decided to keep them during, during resolution period, obviously the company is still going concern, the employees are still there, the employees are not being, the employees are not being paid during resolution. So, uh, and of course the question is that the, the employees could have filed a claim as a part of liquidation procedure, employees could have filed have unpaid salaries will be part of uh, part of the claim. But the question is, if the if the resolution professional decided to keep the employees, because under obligation to keep the unit is going concern, then the salary expense is actually a resolution cost itself. To my mind, this is a part of resolution cost, 
and therefore should be a part of the first item which is 53.1k. Another but uh, very uh, significant question would be that what about the the unit the the resolution plan resolution plan causes the unit to be acquired by somebody else and therefore that acquirer dismisses all the employees and the acquirer now says that the the claims of the employees let's say on account of gratuity or on account of or termination etc claims of all employees will not be admissible as a claim against the acquirer because it's a washout. I mean, the employees did not get the gratuity because they are anyway they were working with the company till the resolution plan was successful. They could not file a claim because there was no gratuity due at that stage. The acquirer now refuses to pay the termination amount of the gratuity payment to the employees. Can the acquirer actually take off those claims or the salary claims of the employees as well? Now, this is also a point where I my view would be that here also this will be part of 531A. Because these are also the employees who would continue to the resolution. If they lose their job and the gratuity and the whatever, the leave and cash flow the unpaid salaries become due as a part of the the transfer that happens in resolution, then this cost also should be forming part of 531A and therefore should be a first priority item. It's quite a long question from Mr. Uh, from C R D Chaudhary, uh, which is uh, quite long, so maybe I might not find it easy to read through, but what is four secured FCs having? Uh, so I think the bit factual complicated question, uh, CARD should be, forgive me for not getting into this question because it's quite long. Mr. Subhas said the charge is not relative to will it be considered unsecured debt? I guess and that's what I mentioned, Mr. Subhas said. My answer is yes, if the charge is not registered with NCA, then the charge is not there at all because section 73 of the company debt, very, section 77 of the company debt, very clearly says that the liquidator will not take cognizance of a charge which is not registered. Uh, Mr. Ramesh Babu says um, while everyone among workmen and employees get discharged, the liquidator is wisdom may take key people at factories and offices to on contract service. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the liquidator may take certain employees on retainership basis. I mean, a contractual basis, retainership basis, all the same. You actually have to do that because uh, the fact that liquidation has come, you will start bringing all uh, people new. So it's quite possible for the liquidator to retain some people on a contractual or leadership basis. That's a very common practice as well. We have also, whatever liquidation time at link, we also done the same thing. The Sibapala Krishnan says in case of amount due to FC secured only by third party and not by the movable or assets, movable or removable assets of the company, is the FC to be classified as secured trader? My answer will be no. In this case, none of the assets of the corporate debtor have been charged in favor of the secure creditor. So the secure creditor does not have a claim on any of the assets of the corporate debtor. And we are dealing with assets of the corporate debtor only. So here the FC will be regarded as unsecured creditor. As far as the CD is concerned, in the case of unsecured creditor. Uh, further questions that come are, well, lots of questions that come. Mr. Kalyan Kumar says, claim of first charge holder is 500 rupees, claim of second charge holder is 3 rupees, when the value of assets only 100. Second charge holder will be allowed to claim no. Second charge holder will not get proportional share, Mr. Kalyan Kumar, because the, the asset of 4 rupees, asset selling of 4 rupees 100, the first charge holder will get first right over the money. There will be nothing paid to second charge holder. Mr. Prakul says, Claim is 10,000 rupees, asset is valued at INR 1,000 rupees. If the assets are valued at 1,000 rupees, other filters also have similar, I mean, there must not be situation of disproportionality among the creditors. Situation should not be disproportional among the creditors. Situation is by last proportional. That would be the same proportion, 10% is attributable to all the creditors, then there is nothing for you to do. However, if different secure creditors have different security interests, and the relation between the claim amount and the asset value is disproportional. In that case, you need to assume only the value of the asset as the amount of secured claim. Uh, sharing PPD is not a problem. Uh, Ramesh Babuji says secured with different set of uneven parties, clubbing them together in the homogeneous category of secured credit will, will drive certain traders with reliable to exercise section 52. Section 52 is perfectly possible. 
that the printer decides to use section, section 52 is not, I mean, anti liquidation. Section 52 should not be seen as something which is unfair, inequitable, or something which is bad. Section 53 is collective process. Section 52 is individual process. Section 53 is collective. That's sealed by the liquidation. Section 52 is individual. But a creditor may, in his wisdom, decide to use individual disposal. Because in many cases, individual disposal will result better results. So section 52 is what the creditor opts for. It's perfectly all right. There's nothing to, I mean, object to in a sale in under section 52. The security area says once the security has relinquished security interest, will all the security interest be treated similar to distribution of proceeds, or will it be done as if they had penny pay switch charge? No, I don't agree, Shitaji. I don't agree on this. As I mentioned, despite the fact that security interest has relinquished security interest. The mutual priorities are not lost. The priority is still really relinquishing security interest is merely bringing the asset into a common hotspot, allowing the liquidator to cause exposure. But the fact that the security creditor was senior or secured or fixed or floating charge holder, that categorization or prioritization will not be lost even if the security interest is relinquished. And this is the key principle emerging from the Supreme Court ruling in the case of Sidco letters. Babita Jain says in case motor vehicle purchase and higher purchase, higher purchase in case of ownership, it's not a case of secured in, security interest, it's a case of ownership. A financial lease or higher purchase in the case of ownership, that would be the person who has given that asset on higher purchase is the owner, is not the creditor. So the person can straight take the asset out. During the moratorium, there's a bar. Once the moratorium is over, the creditor may simply take the asset away. It's not a part of liquidation estate. They can just simply the bailey. One of the exclusions in section 36 by 4 is assets for which you are merely a bailey. You are simply a possess possessor. You are not the owner. So this is one of those cases. Uh, I have another question from uh, Mr. Ajay Verburi who says, Hi, sir, I am non compliant about the safety regulations, companies act, blah, 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 where the Penalty need to be paid for smooth or transition. What does penal charges? I just lost the question. What is, uh, I think the question was, what, when the penal charges fit under section 56? <laughs> Not thought of this question. Uh, but if, if it's uh, something that you're liable to pay, uh, in order to keep the company, you are the liquidator, you have to meet the obligation. So you actually have to pay the part of the liquidation cost. It's something that you need to pay to carry your liquidation affairs. Otherwise, you'll be incurring, I mean, you'll be incurring the rest of uh, breach of law. So I think this is the compliance cost and should form part of the liquidation cost itself. Mr. Kalyan Kumar says section 30 requires minimum liquidation value to OC dissenting FC going by Maharashtra of seamless judgment. If the plan is, uh, that, that, that's an important point. So if the plan wants to pay anything less than liquidation value, the, the good Mr. Kalyan Kumar for pointing this out, I was mentioning that at some point of time earlier that if the secured creditors, if the, the, the FCs, the FCs take value less than liquidation value, there's nothing wrong. The FCs want to take a value which is less than liquidation value, there's still nothing wrong. But the question is, can you force the FCs to take something less than liquidation value? Voluntarily, somebody wants to take less than liquidation value, no issue at all. But you cannot force a creditor to take less than liquidation value. Because the premise is that dissenting FC cannot be paid anything less than liquidation. Those who want to take that up to discuss those you at all. So we are still not deviating from this, the ruling in Maharashtra seamless, where if the FC wants to take, that's perfectly okay. But dissenting FC cannot take anything, uh, cannot be paid anything less than liquidation. Well, I have been told by the organizers to wind up the discussion. So maybe at this stage, I'll have to thank you all. There are lots of questions as I can see. There are questions coming still, so thank you very much. You've been extremely patient. I mean, during this tough time, you can think of insolvency law and uh, and hear me for a good two hours and 15 minutes. I must say you are really extremely enjoying. You, I must uh, I must appreciate your endurance skills. I can also see some of you are putting thanks messages. So, Kalyan uh, Kumarji, thank you very much. I think this is one of the best. I'm extremely grateful for these very, very salutary comments. I wish you all good health. I wish you all uh, safe uh, staying at home. And I also wish you all uh, soon coming out of the lockout. I think that, that, uh, that, that's what I'll hope for everyone. 
So I think thank you very much once again, and thanks for all the solutions coming up. Thanks for ICSI uh, Mandavi ma'am and uh, Shakshu sir as well for offering this chance to interact with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on the platform. Uh, sir, uh, I didn't have a question about the presentation. Uh, 